Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. Great. So uh, welcome back, everyone. Uh, Tim, still alcoholic, surprisingly. After the break, the break did not cure my alcoholism. Um, so uh, someone spoke to me during the break about, uh, I talked about thin ice, that being on thin ice as an alcoholic, I'm going to drink at some point. I need to be on solid ground. Uh, and what does thin ice look like? And what does solid ground look like? Um, I know people who relapsed uh, after many years of recovery who were perfectly competent at living, good relations with people, managed money very well, showed up at work, as Bob B says, worked while they were at work. That's an acquired skill. Um, things going very, very well. And yet the little worm worms its way in and they drink again. And in my first, in my first year, as I said earlier, I'm not going to go into the mental illness uh, that I had. because It's not really the place. I just want to signal that I, I was mentally ill. And in my first year, I was, I was not going to suddenly become cheerful and optimistic and happy-go-lucky and, uh, you know, rubbing along well with people. I, I had an awful lot to learn about how to live. So I, was, I wasn't doing well in my first year in many ways. In some ways, I was doing better than I was when I was drinking. So being on thin ice or being on solid ground, I don't think it's got anything to do with how well you're doing as a, as a person and as a recovering person. I think it's got, um, I think it's got to do with the direction of travel. I hate the phrase, but it's a useful one. Which direction are you headed in? And when I was, this is a good example of this. When I was a few months, when I was a few months sober, I was writing my fourth step. So if you're very new to recovery, the fourth step is where you, you catalogue where you've been going wrong in life. And uh, I was around at my, for some reason, I don't know why, I was around at my sponsor's flat. Um, uh, I had an American, I was in London, I had an, an American sponsor who was, you know, tall and corn fed and i was small and pale and difficult and this sort of thin little wiry skeletal creature with sort of sunken eyes and uh, i was sitting on the floor in his in his apartment in london scribbling away on a piece of paper and the door rang and and the doorbell rang and, and a number of other sort of tall corn-fed Americans with, with very impressive teeth came in. And there were friends that were visiting him from, from Washington or somewhere. Uh, and they were talking to each other. And, and one of them looked around, suddenly realised it was this sort of creature like Gollum sitting in the corner with its pen and its piece of paper. And one of them said, who's that? And my sponsor said, oh, that's Princess. She's writing her fourth step right now. And someone said, why do you call him Princess? He's a Princess Parfait. She does everything she's told. Uh, and I did in my first year. I, did, I, I didn't do it straight away, but I did it. I wasn't as prompt as some people, but I wasn't as slow as others. So what did I do? Uh, I was told to go to meetings, so I did. I didn't argue with it. I just said, okay, I'll go to lots of meetings. I went to a meeting every day. Uh, I remember Maureen, who was 17 years sober at the time, said, um, uh, she said, you must never, ever, 
go to fewer than three meetings a week. Um, and at the moment, I go to plenty more than three meetings a week, but she's never phoned up to say, by the way, I was wrong with that advice. <laughs> so I think it still holds. Uh, but I went to one meeting a day. What, one day in my first year, I didn't go to a meeting. The result was so catastrophic. I thought, I'm not going to try that again. Because I just sat there and I thought, I thought to myself, I ought to be able to have an evening to myself. I thought, that sounds nice, doesn't it? Self-care. I shall look after myself, just like a normal person would. Just sit, at, I, I didn't know what people did. So I sat at home and thought about myself for the whole evening. <laughs> and I was in the most frightful state. And so I, I didn't try that again for a long time. Um, if I went to lots of meetings, I did the step work I was given. I called an awful lot of people. Um, what I was told in my first year was uh, life is what you do in between meetings. And I wasn't suddenly going to become well, but I felt in meetings I had a glimmer at the very least in every meeting I went to that things might be OK. They might be OK. So the meetings I went to were islands of safety. And I had to paddle very hard in between meetings to cope with life. But another thing that I had, I had a little, this was early 90s, a little tape player, and someone would make me copies of, of AA tapes. Now, it's a lot easier these days. You can download endless things to listen to, sort of sober cast and all these different podcasts and uh, websites with AA talks. It's the easiest thing in the world. It's very easy to call people today much easier than it was 30 years ago where you would call people and everyone was out because they were at a meeting so it's very hard to get hold or they are either at work or they're at meetings you know, i've left endless messages on people's phones it's much easier to get hold of people now than it was then uh, i was told if in doubt read the big book listen to a tape or pray because often you couldn't get hold of anyone um, uh, I think we've got it very easy today. At any given moment, you can contact the world of recovery. So there's no, unfortunately, the downside of this is there's no excuse anymore. <laughs> there really isn't. Uh, I developed a healthy mistrust of myself on the back of my last drink. My last drink, as I said earlier, was on the 24th of July, 1993. I'd been in a meeting that day. I'd left the meeting early, gone to the pub, got drunk, gone to the off-license, that's the booze shop, went to the off-license, got some spirits, caused a traffic accident, was arrested. Um, I did not trust myself anymore. But what I trusted was people talked about uh, a number of different things, which I, I've subsumed under the four P's or four words beginning with P. The first one is the uh, program of 12 steps. So I slotted myself into that system. I just did the next thing I was told to do, reported back in with my sponsor and awaited the next assignment. Uh, the principles, and there were principles like Show up, do what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. If you said you were going to turn up at work, turn up at work, regardless of how you feel. If you said you were going to do the tea at the meeting, turn up in plenty of time with the milk, with the biscuits, with the whatever else. Be ready, be on time. Um, do what you said you were going to do when you said you were going to do it. A few basic principles of the program. Keep your mouth largely shut. Is, is never a uh, bad, is never a bad piece of advice. Um, what else? The program, the principles, uh, the people. I trusted the people in AA. I went on a very ill-advised date 
in my first year. Now they say don't date until you've completed your ninth step or have gone a long way into your ninth step. I think it's not bad advice. Um, but I went on an ill-advised date and the date was with someone who was exciting and interesting and clearly dangerous, <laughs> but exciting and interesting. And I was in turmoil the next day and I phoned Maureen. I told her about the situation. She sighed, she paused, and then she said, tear up the number and don't memorize the number before you tear it up. And I did what I was told because I trusted her more than I trusted me because I was the one that got myself into every piece of trouble I ever got into. And ultimately there is the power greater than oneself that can be accessed uh, uh, through prayer and meditation. Uh, well, I'll come to meditation later on today. If anyone, if any of us makes it <laughs> that far, <laughs> we may go and decide to do something else. Who knows? If we make it as far as step 11, we'll discuss meditation. But basically, if you want the short version, is you say prayers to God and then you sit there and see what thoughts come into your mind. And that is that will get you about 80 percent of the way there. just sitting there quietly, just contemplating the question at hand with the higher power in charge, because you said higher power, please be in charge of this process. It's not very complicated. It's meditation for alcoholics, not meditation for spiritual gurus. It needs to, for me, it needs to be very, very basic and straightforward. So the four Ps, I trusted the program, the principles, uh, the people, and the prayer, and that unlocked the power which lies behind all of those. So I just trusted the system, and I stayed sober, and the people around me who didn't trust the system and took matters into their own hands uh, were not okay. Um, an AA speaker from California, now deceased, tells a wonderful story about him and his first sponsor, who he caricatures. As, I'm sure the first sponsor was charming. He caricatures the sponsor as a little bit of a bully. Um, and he recalls his sponsor telling him to do something and him starting to answer, well, in my opinion, and at this point, he was living in a, this gentleman was living in a disused car in the car lot of the AA clubhouse. And the sponsor said, if I want your opinion, I'll put my head through the window of the disused car you're currently living in and ask you for it. <laughs> and uh, the, now it's a, mean little story but i think it illustrates a very very good point which is that um i was almost permanently distressed when i was new in aa and i did not function on any meaningful level i did not have any friends uh i was uh effectively estranged from my family I had no meaningful relationship with any of my family there was a bit of a front I would make phone calls to keep the front up but we didn't talk about we still don't talk about anything particularly real it's very cordial now but there's nothing real there um I I didn't have any skills to work I I could only do unskilled work I had no qualifications of use to man as beast uh, I didn't know how to live. So, of course, I was going to trust people that did know how to live. It's very simple. The, the great thing about AA, if you want to follow someone's advice, you can watch their actual life and say, well, are they doing better than me? Yes, great. I'll do what they did. The terrible thing about professionals, going, my experience going to professionals, you don't get to ask them when they're giving you advice about relationships, what their relationships are like. You're not allowed to ask that. So, well, you're married. Tell me about your marriage. 
you don't, it, it, I, I wasn't allowed to ask any questions. There was just this blank wall giving you things to do. And I didn't know who to trust. In AA, you could, you could see it. You could see how people interacted with each other at the meeting and after the meeting and in their own lives. You're invited to be part of that. And it was on that basis that I learned how to trust people in AA. Um, and that's what the, this surrender business is. It's not abstract. It's surrender to a set of actions and, and saying, I'm going to... There's an old Greek uh, story. Um, I, I mean, a story from old Greece, not a story from old Greek, um, although maybe that too. Old Greek story about... Um, I, 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 it's usually Odysseus in these, but anyway. Uh, captain of a ship. The ship is going through these straits and... Uh, on the top of the cliffs are these sirens who sing this beautiful song, which encourages mariners to dive off the ship into, into the water, and then they dram. They're trying to go after the siren song. And uh, what he advises his mariners to do is to put wax in their ears so they can't hear the siren song. Uh, but he wants to hear it because it's apparently, according to legend, incredibly beautiful. But he doesn't want to destroy himself. So he says, bind me to the mast of the ship with ropes, which are so strong that I cannot escape whatever happens. And don't, don't untie me whatever I say. Now in AA, um, there is no way I can plug my ears with wax sufficiently to drown out the voice of my alcoholism. But I can get myself tied to the mast so that when I hear the siren song, I'm not going to, I can't obey it. And there is something very strange that happened um, by following direction. And I know it's, it's very common for people to say, well, I don't like following direction. I'm not one of those alcoholics that like, well, that's great, but is that doing you any good? So fine, note the fact you don't like following direction, but that need not have any bearing on whether you follow direction. Follow direction and dislike it, fine, but follow it. You don't have to like it. The steps don't care why you take them. They don't ask. Do you want to do this? They don't have an opinion on that. They work. Uh, it's like it's like switching a kettle on. If you don't believe in physics, but you switch a kettle on to boil some water for a cup of tea, it will work regardless of your opinions on physics, regardless of your knowledge or lack of knowledge about physics. The actions activate something. And what they activate in me is the inability to drink even if I want to. It's a very strange, it's a very strange thing. When I was 17 years sober, I was in, how can I put this delicately? I was in a situation with another person. And they had some, as they put it so delicately, outside issues on them, which they were about to snort or smear or something. Um, I don't know what they were going to do. But anyway, the outside issue is going to be introduced into their system. And they offered me some outside issues. And <laughs> you're not allowed to mention drugs in AA, are you? Oops, I've let the cat out of the bag. Um, and part of me, I was not in a great space, as they say. Part of me wanted to use. And then the thought occurred to me, I did not go and retrieve this thought. The thought occurred to me that I had a lot of sponsees at the time. <coughs> Poor things. A lot of sponsees. I knew a lot of people in AA. I thought, what would it do to them if I did this? So I got out of the situation. And that's not the only time that has happened. I had a similar situation 
when I was, I, I can't remember how many years, but a very close friend was drinking again. And of course, I, I go round because I'm going to help. And I went round and I wasn't helping, but I was there. And he said, should we order in some pizza? You know, like, <laughs> just like nothing, there's nothing really happening. And let's have a pizza. We're hungry. Why not? And I thought, wouldn't it just be easier if I joined in with the vodka? Uh, I wasn't in a great state because someone I was very, very close to was drunk. Someone who was very important to me was drunk. I wasn't in a great state. But the training kicked in and the little voice said, get out of here now. So I did. So surrender to the system of action activates a different voice in my head, which tells me the right thing to do. And which somehow I know I must follow. I have no, I, there's a line, let's see if I can find it. So for the page number, this is, um, oh no, wrong page. Yeah, top of page 57, end of We Agnostics. And now this is, this is worded in a beautifully alcoholic way. Listen to this. Save for a few brief moments of temptation. The thought of drink has never returned. Well, wait a second. Wait a second. If there have been a few brief moments of temptation, you can't say the thought of drink has never returned. The thought of drink has returned. Okay, so the thought of drink has returned. Good. Now we've got that clear. Um, it's like having an unexploded bomb. If you said the unexploded bomb never goes off, oh, except when occasionally it does, it's going to go off. The never only means never. If it's never, if it's never except, it means it's going to go off. Okay, so the temptation is going to happen. Uh, but it says, and at such times, a great revulsion has risen up in him. Seemingly, he could not drink, even if he would. God has restored his sanity. This is someone that wants to drink, but finds himself unable to because he's adopted a course of action. When I was pre-AA, I had no choice but to drink. Now I'm doing what I'm supposed to do in AA. I have no choice but to stay sober. It's out of my hands either way. And, and that's what makes life very, very easy for me today. It's out of my hands. Uh, on this subject of suggestions, um, on page 59 of the big book, it says, uh, here are the steps we took which are suggested as a program of recovery. And you will often hear people say, well, you know, I'm glad program is only suggested because I don't like being told what to do. So it's only, it's only suggestions. And there's someone listening to this and it's their story, um, a little anecdote. So I apologize to them. I'm probably going to butcher it and mistell it, but I think it's illustrative of the point I'm going to make about suggestions. Uh, this person was, was uh, living in a foreign country and they crossed the road when the light was red, the, the, little, the little man was red. And they crossed the road, get to the other side. The police officer um, says, uh, uh, that'll be 150 euros. You crossed when it was, you shouldn't have crossed. And my friend said, oh, I'm so sorry. I'm, I'm new to this place. She wasn't new to this place. I'm new to this place. I don't know how this works. I don't know what's going on here. And the police officer says, where you come from, do they have traffic lights? Yes, they have traffic lights. And do you have a little red man and a little green man? Yeah, we have a little red man, a little green man. And the police officer said, where you come from, what does the little red man mean? 
Um, and she said, well, it's just a gentle suggestion that it's probably not a good idea to cross at this point. <laughs> you see, I read suggestion as meaning, oh, I don't have to do it. And then I don't do it. Uh, many years ago, I was in uh, a city in France and we were looking for somewhere for lunch. And it was getting late. All the places were shutting up around two o'clock, three o'clock. The city shuts down. Uh, it was getting towards three o'clock. And we looked on TripAdvisor and it said there are 900 restaurants in this city. And all the, all the ones around us in the main square were like, you know, when it says on TripAdvisor, ranked 547 out of 900 restaurants you don't want to eat there you don't want to eat at the 547th best restaurant in a city so we looked we looked at the ranking we scooted to the top of the ranking so the number one restaurant in this city is just two blocks away but it's going to shut in 10 minutes so we pegged it to this restaurant and it was this little hole in the wall there was a man with wonky teeth. Well, it was France, so he was a man with wonky teeth, um, uh, one of which was <laughs> missing. And he was the chef, and he was the waiter, and he did the dishes, just alternating between the two. There were a couple of little tables inside, one little table outside, two tables, people were just finishing up their desserts and their coffee. There was one table, th uh, one table free. There were three of us. There were three chairs. And we said, this looks great. Number one restaurant in this city, best, best um, reviews. And we said to him, um, uh, what, what's the menu? And he, he, he pointed up towards uh, a chalkboard. And if you've been to France, you'll know it'll say, the chef suggests. And then there's a little, there was a starter, there was a main course, and there is a dessert. And one of us said, uh, is, apart from these suggestions, is there anything else on the menu? He said, no. If you want to eat here, this is what we're cooking today. And the choice was to eat there or eat nothing. And to eat there and eat what was on the menu. Or the, but, but there was no plan B. There was no other option. So yes, in AA, we only suggest that you work the programme, that we work the programme. But we have no plan B for you. If you don't like that, you can stay. We'll feed you biscuits and donuts and coffee until, <laughs> until you're hyperglycemic and very, very edgy. But there is nothing, and we'll take you to Denny's, but there is nothing else we can do for you. We have literally nothing else to offer. So what su suggestion does not mean these steps are optional and I'm sure any other way you figure out will be just as good. It means this is the only thing we have to offer you, but we're not going to force you. The decision is yours. That's a very different meaning to suggestion. Just like with the little red man on the traffic light in this foreign country. Um, if you want to stay alive, you better do what the little red man says. Uh, and so surrendering to the program, which is really what steps two and three are about, to me has got entirely to do with surrendering to a course of action. But let's, let's uh, mention a couple of things about uh, the actual steps two and three. So let me just remind myself, what does it actually say? Came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity and then made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood him. Um, where I come from, very, very few people are religious. Very few people have any religious training whatsoever. It's just not a topic. And there was a sketch about the Church of England on the television 
um, many years ago, where uh, it's an interview between a Church of England priest, comedy sketch, interview between a Church of England priest and someone else, and someone, the, the, some, the interviewer asks him about the Church of England's view about God, and the Church of England priest in the sketch says, well, God is mentioned. When you turn on the television in England, doesn't matter how many channels you cycle through, you will not find a preacher on there anywhere. Um, uh, if someone tries to invoke God in a political context, they're laughed at. It, that, that, that it's, it's, it's front page news and it's in all, all of the radio sketches for that week that someone dared to mention religion in a political context. The British, in my experience, are embarrassed that religion even exists. I gather from my American friends that things are slightly different here. <laughs> and people come to AA with shall we say, a little bit of experience of religion and the occasional view and opinion about it, ranging from, you know, so-and-so is my Lord and Saviour through to quite a different view. And then you're presented with step two and three. I think we have a cleaner time of it in England because, uh, because it's just not a topic. Um, but there are some there are some lines in the chapter we agnostics, which is the chapter on step two. In case you were wondering where they were hiding that, um, there's a paragraph at the bottom of page forty five, which I think is very very useful to anyone that comes with a any preconceptions or ideas about religion and about God. So it says, we have shared his honest doubt and prejudice. Some of us have been violently anti-religious. To others, the word God brought up a particular idea of him with which someone had tried to impress them during childhood. Perhaps we rejected this particular conception because it seemed inadequate. With that rejection, we imagined we had abandoned the God idea entirely. Um, although I can't find it, it's going to say somewhere that we can, we can just disregard those, those ideas. But it's this line here, perhaps we rejected this particular conception. Um, the way I deal with this and dealing with my head being full of other people's ideas about God. You see, I, I came to AA thinking that people who believed in God were a little bit simple and to be pitied and obviously wrong. Uh, and so obviously wrong, I didn't even need to think about whether they were wrong. It, they were just self-evidently wrong. Uh, and I had ideas of the God that other people believed in. What I was encouraged to do was to set aside all of this, to set aside every idea about the higher power, every idea about God, whether good or bad, and to just start with a completely blank sheet of paper. And to go with the phrase, a power greater than oneself. Um, and to look at that word by word. So we're not asked to believe in God or the, the God that you think you know about from television or from, from, from church or whatever. We're asked to believe in a power greater than ourselves, that that's what's going to solve the problem. Um, and the way I deal with it is this. I say, well, what is a power greater than myself? It's all through the chapter, we're agnostics. It talks about a pair of ideas knowledge and power information or direction and power and if you're driving if you want to get somewhere you need to have two pieces of information the first one is how to get somewhere so you've got to have your your satellite navigation system your gps with the correct address plugged in and you've got to have gas in the engine of the car if you have only one 
you can't get anywhere. If you don't know where to go, you can't get there. If you know where to go, but don't have the power, you don't have the gas in the engine, you can't get there. And as an alcoholic, my problem is that my head is full of nonsense. I don't know what to do. I can't even tell whether I should drink or not. <laughs> because drink would seem to me like a terribly good idea. So I've got an information problem there, but I've also got a power problem. Uh, I would know that I shouldn't drink, but be unable to stop myself. I remember when I was in Russia, and this was about March, 1993, my friend said to me, should we go out this evening? And I said, you go, you go out. I'll just have a quiet evening to myself. And I mentioned one of my quiet evenings to myself earlier, and you'll start to see a pattern here. Whenever I say I'm going to have a quiet evening to myself, or at least this was true in the past, I think it's different now, uh, there was dirty work afoot. There was trouble ahead when I wanted to have a quiet evening to myself. As soon, And I did not know that I was planning this. I don't know if you've ever done this. You, 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 don't, you have no idea that there is a plan, that there is a scheme, that there is a plot until you watch it play out. And it's as though the whole thing was arranged and you're watching a film, you're watching it happening. As soon as they were gone, I looked out of the window to make sure, I was in on the 17th floor, I looked out of the window to make sure that they were definitely gone up the street and wouldn't be able to see me. They knew that I joined AA and that I was sober at this point. Uh, I'd let them go off, check they were gone, scooted downstairs. The tower blocks in St. Petersburg would have a shop in the basement, so you didn't need to go out in the winter. You could just stay in when it was very cold. So I went to the kiosk. I bought a bottle of Hungarian brandy and took it back to my room, and I placed it in the opposite corner and started to have a conversation with it about whether or not I was going to drink it. And it became apparent that this whole plan had been hatched long before I went down to buy the bottle. And I genuinely did not want to drink it. And as I was drinking it, I was thinking to myself, I don't want to be doing this, but look at me, I'm doing it. And when I'd finished drinking it, I thought, I wish I hadn't drunk that, but I'd done it. Lack of power, I was drinking against my own wishes here. Um, lack of power is my problem. Lack of information and lack of power. Now, some of people say, I'm an atheist, very proudly. Um, and uh, there are different technical definitions. One of the technical definitions is... Uh, believing that you have definite proof of the non-existence of God. Agnosticism, strictly speaking, I'm given to understand is the position where you say, it can't possibly be known whether or not there is a God. It's not, oh, I don't know, maybe there is, maybe there is. It's not, no, it's a position that it cannot be known whether there is a God or not. As soon as you start using the word God, you're sunk because the word God is associated with ideas that have been rattling around your head like a dried walnut for the last 40 or 50 years. So let's leave the word God aside. So power greater than myself. So I say, well, can I believe in a power greater than myself? And a couple of <laughs> examples. Well, and I, I think it's impossible not to believe in a power greater than yourself. And I'll tell you why. You go back through your life and you ask yourself, with those two commodities, information and power, have I ever received information from outside of myself which proved useful in any way that I could not possibly have come up with myself? And you'll find thousands of examples where you learn how to take apart a motorcycle engine or cook a dish of some description or do anything. There's lots of information that one has acquired that one hasn't come up with oneself. Even how to work a television. You read the instruction, you can't work it out, you can't work. Of course, I'm sure you're like me. 
I don't look at the instructions. I just think I haven't got time for that. So I spend three hours teaching myself wrongly how to use it. And then I look at the instructions and they were there. It was there all along. Anyway, even something as simple as <coughs> figuring out how to, how to drive a car. Most people are taught how to drive a car. Sure, there's stuff you can figure out, but boy, do certain pieces of information help in the process of learning how to drive a car. If you're reverse parking or parallel parking, if you're taught how to do it, it's quicker than figuring it out yourself. So, right. Okay. So there is information out there which is accessible, which I could not have come up with myself. But that falls short. What about power? If you've ever lacked confidence and gone to someone else and had a pep talk and they gave you the confidence to apply for something or, or ask someone out on a date and you summon through the conversation with another person the confidence, you're given the confidence you couldn't have summoned on your own. You have accessed power <coughs> and power in, in, in physics is the ability to get work done the ability to do something. Um, if you've ever accessed power in that sense, if you've been to an AA meeting and felt more able to stay sober that day than you did before the meeting, and it's not because people were wise and insightful, there's just something which gives people strength. If you've ever accessed information from outside of yourself, if you've ever accessed power from outside of yourself, well done, you now believe in a power greater than yourself. The only question remaining is, is that power, is that information and power combo sufficient to overcome alcoholism? You've just proved, by the way, the existence of God, because God is the code word for the power greater than oneself. And that's how I dealt with this. I do not need to borrow another person's concept of God or a religion's concept of God I can just go with the phrase power greater than myself and work from there. And then I take the word God and say, that's my code word for it. I know what I mean by it. You can mean by it, by it whatever you want. Um, the question is, can that power restore me to sanity? What is sanity? Sanity is not drinking, even though I want to. Um, and it's very simple. I remember sitting in a meeting in, in Fulham in London, uh, what, 29 and a half years ago, and saying to myself, these people clearly have nothing in common uh, with each other. People from all sorts of different classes, uh, landed gentry sitting next to people who lived on the street in the same meeting, you know, <laughs> about to go off and have lunch together. Um, a friend of mine, uh, 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 a friend of mine, talks about a story where there was a uh, he was with an AA woman, um, and they were standing outside a courtroom. She was a high-powered attorney in Los Angeles or somewhere, and uh, they were with a, a couple of clients and these these, these you know, highfalutin types, and they're all talking there in their smart business suits and. A man walks past, long beard, shopping trolley, full of plastic bags, and says, hello, Janet. And Janet says, hello, back. And, and they say, how do, you, how, how do you know that street person? She says, oh, we have lunch together sometimes. Uh, it's a very good description of AA. We have lunch with people that we wouldn't normally have lunch with. And you look around the meeting and you say, this works not because all these people have like this special thing in common that I don't have. You can't find a common denominator of people in AA. We so, or to me, so obviously only have in common alcoholism. If it works for you, the presumption is it, why wouldn't it work for me? And there's one bit, so identification. I've been thinking a lot about this recently. Identification is super helpful, I think, for getting people through the door of AA. I think it's also super helpful in step two, where 
I hear my own story told back to me in various guises. And no one person has the whole story, but I puzzled together the pieces until after a few months in AA, there was nothing in my story which was particular to me. I was a combination of all the different bit of bits and pieces I saw in other people. I remember one of my tricks when I was drinking was to sit or lie in the middle of a fast road trying to get run over so that I would die, but it not be my fault on account of suicide because my brother was an alcoholic who committed suicide and he used up the family's suicide voucher. So until someone commits suicide in a family, in my experience, it's not a topic. As soon as someone has committed suicide, boy, is it a topic. It's there as part of the wallpaper of the family. And it's so clear what the suicide did to everyone else in the family and continues to do decades later that uh, I couldn't in all conscience really go through that. I know in some families, sadly, they do, nonetheless but I couldn't. But I tried to construct situations in which I would die so that I could be dead, but it not be my fault, apparently. So I could die without guilt. And I remember sharing this very proudly in a, proud, in a meeting, uh, thinking, how special am I, the hero of this very particular story? And one by one, four other people said they'd done the same thing. And I hated them for it because I was no longer special. I was just one of a whole long line of dorks who did the same thing. And my sense of specialness was gradually eroded to the point that I could not believe I knew it was going to work for me fundamentally because it worked for all of these other people. And then the most terrible thing happened. And I don't recommend this at all. I was in a terrible state one day. I knew I was going to drink. And uh, I'd never prayed before. And I'll, I'll tell the short version. I opened a Bible on a particular page. I was living with my sister. I opened the Bible on the particular page. And it fell open to the line, be still and know that I am God. And my alcoholic mind, which had been rattling away the whole day, telling me to drink, and I'd been arguing with, am I going to drink? Am I not going to drink? If I'm going to drink, when am I going to drink? Shall I do it now, get it out of the way, blow away the cob cobwebs, come back to AA tomorrow? The argument stopped when I w and I went to sleep and didn't drink. When I woke up the next morning, I thought the, sh the, the, the game is up, because I now know that if I pray, in that state, I'll be all right. And I, I thought, damn, I, I can't drink anymore. I'm, I've been given access to power. And now I had it. It was my responsibility to do something about it. I couldn't hide behind powerlessness anymore. There was a solution if I would have it. And you're then placed at the threshold of step three, to turn your will and life over to a power greater than yourself. Now, my image of what step three was when I was new in AA uh, was this. And frankly, for many years, so my understanding of step three has changed a lot, as I think it should. <clears throat> my idea was, I'm still in charge. I'm marvellous. I'm going to learn how to have a great life sober. And in emergencies, I'll call upon God. Now I've got drinking out of the way. I'll get a job. I'll get a qualification. I'll get a career. I'll get a house. I'll get a relationship. I'll put, get a pension scheme in place. I'll get a mortgage. I'll have snazzy friends who are suave and will go to fancy places and do fancy things. And I'm going to be sensational. And if I have trouble, I, God will be my little helper. And I'll use the steps because they will get my pesky little character defects out of the way. And I'll learn how to be sophisticated and agreeable and get my own way better. And 
I don't know if you've been to meetings where people have said this. They've said things like, AA is really great because I've got my life back. And I've got my job and I've got, I heard someone why he said, I've got a PhD, whatever that is. I've got a PhD now I'm sober. And I've uh, all these wonderful things. And I did, I did this, I didn't get a PhD. Um, uh, <laughs> I've got a skin condition is one I got in my first few years. <laughs> uh, <laughs> just never completely cleared up. But that's another question. But we can shake hands, it's fine. You won't get it. Anyway, that's a different question. Um, I never know what I'm going to say in these things. Um, <laughs> my first eight years of AA, uh, I finished studying something. I studied something else. I, I got a, an occupation. I didn't do badly. I got a little bit of money. I wasn't rich, but I got enough to pay the bills okay. and live somewhere, which looked pretty reasonable considering where I'd come from. <laughs> Uh, I got a, a relationship with a wonderful person. We got on very well. We we went on holidays. It all looked absolutely great, except for one tiny thing. I was waking up at four o'clock in the morning having panic attacks. I got everything I wanted and it didn't work. Uh, my life was based for those first few years. And I did sponsor and I did do the steps and I did go to lots of meetings, but about getting uh, this little list that someone gave me a while ago, still true, money, sex, power, prestige, comfort, thrills, and appearance. Now, as all very well, uh, but those commodities, money, sex, power, prestige, comfort, thrills, and appearance, uh, it's like pouring liquid into an imaginary pot. When you're doing the pouring, it looks like it's going to fill up the pot, but the pot is still empty. I still felt empty and sometimes dead and disconnected from the outside, and at the same time terrified. I would lose these things that I had in my life, which weren't fixing me anyway. As George Carlin would say, uh, earning money in a job you hate to buy things you don't need to impress people you don't like. And it's not a great way to live. <laughs> uh, my understanding of step three is very, very different now. Uh, to turn my will and my life, it means to turn over my my schedule. <laughs> and the, my schedule starts from when I wake up in the morning till when I go to sleep. So that's a lot. And my thought life. So what now? One point on thought. People say I can control my what I do, but I can't control what I think. Not true. I can't control the thoughts that come into my mind, but with a lot of practice, I can control which thoughts I run with and which thoughts I do not. It, it's very interesting. There's a line on page 66 of the big book when it's talking about resentment, which is any kind of grinding, negative thinking about some situation or person in my life. I'm preoccupied with how they're wrong and it's affecting me. It says to the extent that we permit these, they don't happen to me, they happen by me. The temptation to, resi to resent does not come from me, but yielding to that temptation does come from me. Now, one mustn't feel guilty about this. Let me just get rid of this on here. Um, it takes a lot of practice. If your mind is not in your control, it's bringing it, under, bringing it to heel. It's like if you've ever looked after a dog that is a few years old and has been let run wild, they're very, very difficult to bring under control again, to, to, to turn them in, to tame them. 
they might never be entirely tamed, but they can be trained by the right person. And the alcoholic mind or just the human mind is a little bit like that. If you spent a few decades not learning how to manage what goes on in your mind, it's going to be a rough ride as you learn how to do it. In the same way, it's a rough ride training a dog. But it's better than this huge dog pulling you behind it with, you know, you're, you're holding the dog with the lead, but the dog is in charge. And that's what I was like with my mind when I came to AA. So the decision in step three is a decision to turn my schedule and my thought life over to this power greater than myself. Now, there are two parts to this. The first part is I need to do this in order to stay sober because what I want will kill me if I get it. Alcohol will kill me if I get it. Drugs will kill me if I get it. A few other things will kill me if I get them. So I've got to not be in charge in order to stay alive. Because if I'm in charge, I'll drink and then the whole thing starts again. But by page 60, uh, it's already established this. Where it says, uh, middle of page 60, that we were alcoholic and could not manage our own lives. Tick. That probably no human power could have relieved our alcoholism. Tick. Other people's good advice did not work. And people in AA talking me out of drinking does not work. That God could and would if he was sought. In other words, the power that lies behind the system that AA operates will keep me sober, despite my wishes. Fine. But there's two pages of material before we actually do the turning of our wills and our lives over to God. So why is that? There? If we already know by page 60, God needs to be in charge. What are those two pages about? If I think that my best interests, that, that so I've got to turn my will and life over to God in order to stay sober, but I've got my own plans and designs, I'm going to resist the whole process. If I think that my interests lie in me doing what I want to do, I'm not going to, I'm not going to do, I'm not going to hold up my side of the bargain. So the next two pages are about basically convincing me that to turn my will and life over to God is a really, really good idea, completely setting aside the drink and drug question. I've got to be convinced that it's the, that, that it's the, it's the right horse to bet on. And there's a very simple way to do this. I didn't really, I, I, took step three in a, in a fa after a fashion when I was new and it was it seemed to be good enough to, to get and keep me sober but the full meaning of step three this idea of turning my will and life over to God so that I'm it, it's like work I've got a friend uh, I've known people that have worked for the, this, this I better not say the name of the bank a big bank um, where when you sign up to work for them, basically your life now belongs to them. Where, you know, you're working 90 hours a week and uh, yeah, you've got a lot of money, but you can't really plan anything. If they say jump, you jump. If they say you're coming into work at the weekend, you come into work at the weekend. If they say you're going to work, do an all-nighter, you're doing an all-nighter and you have no choice in the matter. You belong to the company. The French Foreign Legion is much like this as well. Uh, Turning your will and life to God is the same thing, except it's not malevolent. It does you no ill. My schedule is my whole life. And it talks in Bill's story, I think it's page 16. Faith has to work in and through us 24 hours a day. Because you don't know when, it's like a fire alarm. If you don't know when the fire is going to go off, you need to have the fire alarm on the whole time. If you don't know when the crazy person is going to try the door of your car to get into it, to hotwire it, to steal it, if you don't know when they're going to try it, it needs to be locked the whole time. If I'm going to be safe in the moment that a thought of a drink occurs to me, I need to be in God's care the whole time. It can't be just here and there. And in an emergency, the whole basis for my life has to be completely different. 
which means my schedule must be in God's hands and my thought life must be directed and guided by God. Now, this is a very big ask until you look at a particular idea on page uh, uh, 60, where it says the first requirement is that we be convinced that any life run on self-will can hardly be a success. And what that means in plain, ordinary English is uh, if I think making a list of all the things that I want and running after them is going to make me happy, I am wrong. Because that is, frankly, how most people I've ever met live. And most people I've ever met are not doing so well. And you look around in society and you look at how many people are drugged one way or another because they cannot stand how they feel living life the way they live. And the fact is, when my life is based around getting what I want, if you, if you want sex and just looking at sex and money, uh, as two, and there are seven, there are seven, sex, money, power, prestige, comfort, thrills, and appearance. Uh, you can't desire something sexually and make it happen without terrible consequences. You cannot desire money and make it happen. It's very, very hard to get a lot of money. It's very hard to get power especially when everyone else wants power. Uh, it's a game that one can't win. And as I said earlier, even if one does happen to win temporarily, there is now the fear of it being taken away. And my suffering was created not by not getting my own way. It was by having a way that I wanted to get. It was by having this endless list of demands and desires and expectations when I get this job when I get this relationship, when I get this bank balance, if I can get some security, if I can get a long-term contract, if, I, if, 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 if some butts were candy and nuts, we'd all have a Merry Christmas. Mm. <laughs> uh, it, the system does not work. If the system worked, everybody around you in your life would be serene, pleasant and cooperative but they're probably not the system does not work and cannot work is he not a victim of the delusion that he can wrest happiness and satisfaction from this world if he only manages well page 61 now i knew for a long time that i was unhappy because i couldn't get my own way in the world but is he not a victim of the delusion I backed the wrong horse in the first place. And the simplest way to recognize this system failed. Uh, when I was in my 30s, which seems a very long time ago now, uh, I was listening to some kind of AA talk about the big book. I was maybe 15 years sober. And the speaker was asking questions to the audience rhetorical questions so they weren't actually answering but there were encouraged people being encouraged to ask themselves these questions and see what the internal answer was and the conversation went something like this are you happy and i thought to myself well i'm better than i was i'm, I'm 15 years sober I was better than I was at 10 years sober, better than I was at five years sober, certainly better than I was when I was drunk. But I was not at peace. I was not content. There, were, there was an underlying dis-ease. My relationship with my mother was, was, was a catastrophe. Um, there, there were compulsions active in my life, compulsive behavior, impulsive behavior. Uh, there were all sorts of things that weren't right. And I had to say, I wasn't happy. Better than I was, but I wasn't happy. And the character said, how long have you been spending your life 
living life as you see fit. And I thought to myself, well, my whole life. So let's say 35 years, give or take. And then came the clincher. When did you think your plan was going to kick in? What, you're going to give it another six months? That's going to work, is it? If it was going to work, if it was going to kick in, it would have worked by now. Why not just admit defeat? Why not just admit that you've, it, it's the, 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 the gambler's illusion? Because you've lost so much money on the table, you might as well give it another go because you might win all of it back. That was the logic. I might as well just plow on with my plan A for life because it's got to kick in at some point. Uh, but that, hearing that tape, it just cut through that. And I thought, I'm willing to admit I've been entirely wrong and look at things a different way. And that was about um, uh, 14, 13, 14 years ago now. And I have to say, uh, my external life doesn't look hugely different than it does 14 years ago. But I'll tell you, when I wake up in the morning, I'm all right. I don't have what they refer to as the shitty committee talking to me. Uh, when I can't sleep, I'm at perfect peace. It doesn't trouble me. I'm not troubled by thoughts in the middle of the night. I haven't had a panic attack in 14 years. I haven't had depression in 14 years. I haven't had any real anxiety. I've had little fears here and there. And sometimes for a few hours, things preoccupy me. Uh, but the, that dis-ease has gone. And it's gone because I backed a different horse. And so I was to say to God, you're in charge. Uh, and I'm just going to concern myself with four things. Where do I go? I say, and to whom? Everything else is outside my hula hoop. Very, very simple life. What do I do today? And that's the whole of it. And that gets implemented in two ways. First of all, steps four through nine, which clear out the, which are the spring clean, cleans out the cupboards. And steps 10 through 12, uh, which is how to live on a daily basis. Um, and we'll cover those throughout the rest of the day. So, uh, uh, Josh, would you like to uh, turn the recording off and we'll come back at... Thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.